Welcome to the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. This is episode 38, the first show of the second season of the Revolution Nothing Less show. It is February 4th, 2021. My name is Andy Z. I'm the host of the show. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, and I am joined by my co-host, Sansara Taylor, who is in New York City. How are you doing, Sansara? Andy, I'm doing great. I'm in the middle of a huge blizzard snowstorm, but doing pretty well. And I'm, I'm so excited about season two. Really proud of what we did in the first 37 episodes, but here we go. We're, we're, we're ready to build on all of that and take it even higher. Okay, well, I feel like getting diverted to talk about that. I miss the snow, but I'm enjoying the, the warm weather here in Los Angeles. But to all of you who are watching this show for the first time, we take our name, Revolution Nothing Less, from a film made by Bob Avakian in 2012. It is a film that tells us the entire picture of why we need an actual revolution an actual revolution to overthrow this system that so oppresses people here and around the world, that causes so much misery and destroys the planet. It talks about how when we overthrow this system, and I say we, I mean millions of people, how we could bring about a better world, a radically different world. And Bob Avakian has also written a constitution for a new socialist republic in North America that's a blueprint for this world that would Take us on the road to real emancipation. He's developed a new communism, a new communism that is the scientific method and the strategy, which means the plan for how we could actually get to this new society. And so that's something you learn about every week in, in our show and that you're going to learn about today from what we've got cooking in this episode. So why don't we tell people about what, we, what we've got planned for today and how that will uh, foreshadow the rest of the season. Yeah, so we have a we have a really great show today. Um Bob Avakian, who Andy was just talking about, has put out a New Year's statement and it's called A New Year, the urgent need for a radically new world for the emancipation of all humanity. So this is a statement that in our, our first segment Andy is going to do a commentary that's going to be an introduction, an invitation, and a challenge to you to get into this. Um, it's also going to be this statement from Bob Avakian, which you can find on revcom.us, the website we produce this show in collaboration with, um, is going to be the foundation of a lot of the segments that we do in the coming weeks. It's a very, as you'll see in his commentary, it's, it's, a, it's a meaty piece, it's an inspiring piece, it's a challenging piece. So that's going to be our first segment. We're also going to do, um, people need to know, there are political prisoners in Iran who have really courageously stood up against the Islamic Republic there, that very repressive regime. These are our people. Anybody with a heart, this is the internationalism that we bring to this show. We're going to have a segment about a very important program coming up this weekend put on by Revolution Books to free Nasreen, who's one of those political prisoners, and all Iranian political prisoners. We'll, we'll have Raymond Lada on to talk about that and give you a fuller sense of that. A um, few other segments. you want to talk about them, Andy? Yeah, well, then uh, after that, we're going to have a segment where you actually get to see Bob Avake in, in action. Uh, in uh, 2014, at Riverside Church in New York, Bob Avake, in, together with Cornell West, gave a talk uh, and a dialogue that was called Revolution and Religion, the Fight for the Emancipation and the Role of Religion, a dialogue between Cornell West and Bob Avake. In. And after they each gave pre presentations, Bob Avakian, they sat down, and Cornell West, they sat down for a conversation. We're going to show you just a little bit of that, where you get some feeling for uh, the person of Bob Avakian, as well as the content of what the two of them were talking about. So that will be our third segment. And then what comes after that, Sansara? Well, we have, we have two things. We have a, a short piece from one of the members of the Revolution Tour, the Get Organized for an Actual Revolution Tour, that's going to be telling you about ways that you can get involved in discussions and wrangling to get further into this statement from Bob Avakian and to get further into the revolution. This show is actually about changing the world, and we want to invite you into that process, so you'll hear a little bit about that um, later in the show. And then our final segment, this is our first episode during Black History Month, so we are going to bring alive some of the actual criminality in a very vivid way of the history of this country. We have a feature that we do frequently on this show called American Crime. 
And we are going to feature this time a segment that was uh, put together by the filmmaker David Zeiger, an American crime on the Tulsa massacre. So that's very heavy. It's very important. And it's and it's really well put together. I think everybody should will learn a lot and want to share that with everybody. And then we have a special surprise treat at the end of the show, but you have to stay for the whole show to find out what it is. But it, You know, I leaked the treat halfway through the episode in my interview with Raymond Lada, so you'll get a teaser. Well, oh, no, don't give any hints there, but okay, well, look, why don't we get going? All right. All right, so very we'll, good. All right, so, so first up is the commentary that uh, uh, I'm going to do about Bob Avakian's new statement. We begin our second season with a New Year's statement from Bob Avakian titled, A New Year, the urgent need for a radically new world for the emancipation of all humanity. Bob Avakian, BA's New Year's statement is a blast, not just a breath of fresh bracing air in a suffocating moment in history. Hundreds of millions, if not billions of people are choking and gasping for air from COVID, from the destruction of the atmosphere, from fires and floods and poisoned water, and even more from the vile bile of ruling classes around the world who demonize and torment the masses of humanity worldwide with their rule and their boastful, endless insistence that this is the best and really the only way the world could be. BA's statement is a salvo for a new year against all of this, inviting and fighting for you, for millions of people, to see how and why a radically new world is possible. Precisely because the hour is late for the survival of the earth and life on it, because fascism and the reactionary regimes are rearing their heads everywhere with all the brutality, death, destruction, oppression, and repression that this system weighs so heavy on people's lives and spirits, you should take the time and take in the whole of B.A.'s statement a new year, the urgent need for a radically new world, and the emancipation of all humanity. Bob Avakian pulls the lens back, and he doesn't pull punches. B.A. says that even as it is a very good thing that the fascism of the Trump-Pence regime was defeated in the election, the opposition between the fascist Republican Party and the Democrats will not only continue, but he says in this statement, it, quote, does not represent the fundamental divisions in society and the world, nor the fundamental interests of the masses of people in this country and in the world as a whole, nor can the profound problems confronting humanity be solved. In fact, they can only get worse within the confines of this murder murderously oppressive and exploitive system and the chaos and destruction it will continue to unleash on a massive scale so long as it continues to dominate the world. But that is not all. B.A. goes on to warn and to awaken us to the reality that, quote, the electoral defeat of the Trump-Pence regime only, quote, buys some time, end quote. Both in relation to the imminent danger posed by the fascism this regime represents, and more fundamentally, in terms of the potentially existential crisis humanity is increasingly facing as a consequence of being bound to the dynamics of this system of capitalism imperialism, end quote. What is this system of capitalism imperialism? These words are being bandied about today, even by politicians. But what is capitalism? What is imperialism? Why do we need to know what they are and how they work? Do they describe a system that is broken, or is this a system working the only way it can, causing horrific suffering of literally billions of people? Is capitalism the only way society can be organized? Is humanity capable of rising above the dog-eat-dog -dog world we live in? What does an economic system have to do with the systemic oppression of black people, of people of color, of women, of LGBTQ people, of people in countries around the world. And what is the way to understand this? What is the way out of the madness that we say Baba Vakian has developed? Do you, does humanity, have to stay ignorant of the way the world works? Subject to the rantings of demagogues and to the empty promises of so-called reformers who claim they can fix what is beyond repair? 
Over the coming weeks and months, we will be digging into this and breaking it down on the RNL show. And we will be providing you, the audience, with an online series of discussions, zoom into the revolution, we're calling them, of different kinds, some for just learning about and getting introduced to the statement, getting introduced to BA and to the work he has done, and others that will be a four-week participatory seminar to engage this statement with others. And a young member of the Get Organized for an Actual Revolution tour is going to be speaking about this later in this very program. A moment ago, I quoted Bob Avakian saying in this statement, quote, The electoral defeat of the Trump-Pence regime only buys some time. Both in relation to the imminent danger posed by fa the fascism this regime represents, and more fundamentally, in terms of the potentially existential crisis humanity is increasingly facing as a consequence of being bound to the dynamics of this system of capitalism imperialism. More questions leap to mind. What underlying changes in the world and in the U.S. have given rise to the Trump-Pence regime's fascism? What really drives this virulent fascist movement that denies the very concept of truth? What economic, political, and social changes gave rise to and fuels the Christian fascist movement in this country and religious fundamentalist fascism around the world? B.A. quotes the Miami Herald columnist Leonard Pitts, who wrote that there really are two countries now sharing one border. Really, will honeyed words calling for unity overcome the great divides in this country? And how deep are those divides? and why. That's some heavy shit. B.A. says we've only bought some time with the election of Biden. That's a serious forecast. That's not something to gloss over, but something we need to understand. The import and the implication is tremendous. In his statement, B.A. goes into what's behind it with substance and with science. He brings evidence he brings analysis to the evidence, and most of all, he brings us to the method and approach by which he arrived at these conclusions, so that all of us, whether we are experienced at working with theory, or we've never been exposed or grappled with it before, so that all of us can understand and take up a scientific way to know, and then to, on that basis, to change the world. B.A. says, quote, to understand why we are confronted with the situation we are it is necessary to not merely respond to and in effect be whipped around by what is happening on the surface at any given time, but to dig beneath the surface, to discover the underlying mainsprings and causes of things and arrive at an understanding of the fundamental problem and the actual solution, end quote. We should not be scared of or dismissive of science. What we should be scared of is not knowing how society and the world we live and suffer under actually works. We should be concerned about how and why bullshit is everywhere. And it is most sharply revealed in the millions of people believing that some mysterious secret forces are conspiring against white Christian people and that Trump won the election by a landslide as their God ordained he would. And we should be concerned, too, by the poisonous notion that comes from people who are coming from a far better place that opposes injustice but it is a way of thinking about the different kinds of oppression, a thinking that runs through the progressive movements that only what you experience yourself is true, or at least for you. That someone like you or someone who is oppressed in one way or another organically possesses an understanding of the cause and the solution to oppression, including their own. Understanding the world in this kind of way leaves you blind to the real causes and the solution to the monumental problems that humanity faces. This is completely different and opposed to a scientific method and approach to understanding, as B.A. says, quote, the underlying mainsprings and causes of things to arrive at an understanding of the fundamental problem and the actual solution, end quote. In his New Year's statement, B.A. brings alive the dynamics of how the world has changed in relation to the oppression of black people, to the position and the heightening oppression of women here and internationally, to the changes to where and how our food is grown and distributed, and what all of this has to do with the rise of political forms of religious fundamentalism that are fueling theocratic fascist movements around the world 
and leading to the death of the planet we live on. These driving forces are not going to be cured by small changes to the system we live, and live under, any more than a deadly cancer will be cured only by eating right, much less a Band-Aid. Most of all, B.A. brings in this statement and in his work overall a way out of the madness we face. He doesn't just call for a radically new world for the emancipation of all humanity. He opens the door to this new world and how we can get there through a great liberating struggle, building a movement today that is preparing for the time when we could actually make a revolution for that radically new world. What guides this? and the new society that is concentrated in the Constitution for a new socialist republic in North America that B.A. has authored is the new communism. The new communism opens up the road to human emancipation, to real emancipation, on the foundation of a more scientific method and approach to society and to revolution. The new communism, quote, from Bob Avakian, quote, firmly rejects any approaches that amount to applying and justifying the bankrupt and extremely harmful notion that the ends justify the means, and that truth is just an instrument of desired objectives, rather than what it actually is, a correct reflection of objective reality. B.A. has said, quote, this is not a revolution for revenge. The goal is not for exploited and oppressed humanity to have a chance to become exploiters and oppressors themselves. It is a communist revolution whose goal is nothing less than putting an end to all relations of exploitation and oppression and all the degradation and destruction that is bound up with this throughout the world. B.A.'s New Year's statement is an invitation and a call to struggle, not only against the powers that be, but with each other, over what is the problem and what is the solution, a struggle that necessarily involves how people think. It is a fight for an objective scientific method and approach, which means not how I wish things to be, but how things actually are, and on that basis, how they really could be changed to bring about a world where all people all over the world could flourish. Yes, the Trump-Pence regime is gone from the pinnacle of presidential power. A sigh of relief is understandably felt by all of us. But relief is not the same as hope and struggle on a scientific basis for a future where all of humanity could thrive and live in sustainable harmony with the earth. A sigh of relief that leads to a retreat into an oblivious individualism of my life, my family, my problems, my people. Such an approach will lead to a return to a world that will only result in the relentless workings of the capitalist system accelerating the growth of the very fascism you're relieved to be free of and the ravaging of the people and the environment. There is no shelter from the storm for 7 billion people on the planet. There is no hoping that the dark forces of white supremacy, patriarchy, and the vicious xenophobia that fuels the theocratic conspiracy-addled forces of Trump fascism will go quietly into the night. They will not. There is not only the future of Trumpism replaced by the killing confines of the Democratic Party politics as usual, with their promises and brocades of lofty words that cover up and excuse the continuation of the grinding oppression of this system. There is a third and a far better future, and there is a road forward, a hard but liberating road to that future. There is the extraordinary leadership for that struggle in Bob Avakian. There is a force that is beginning to gather to make that real, a movement that needs you and is inviting you to get into B.A.'s statement for the new year. A radically new world for the emancipation of all humanity. This is not just a dream. It is a dream that really could be. And with that, once again, welcome to Revolution Nothing Less. Free Nasreen, free all Iran's political prisoners, heroism for these times. That is the name of a very important panel discussion taking place this Sunday, sponsored by Revolution Books. 
And here to talk with us about it is a spokesperson for Revolution Books, a political economist and a writer for Revcom.us, Raymond Lada. Welcome back to the Revolution Nothing Less show. Thanks for having me on, Sansar. Great. So why don't you tell us, just start us off, tell us about this program, what's its importance? Yeah, this is a special program about this documentary, Nazreen. And that film, uh, which was recently uh, made, uh, traces the defiant and courageous journey of Nazreen Sotadeh. And Nazreen is an Iranian lawyer, an Iranian lawyer. Uh, she's a political prisoner and a human rights activist and really quite an extraordinary human being. And she is in prison now, uh, sentenced to 38 years and 148 lashes by a whip. Okay, and this is in retaliation for the fact that she has stood with the oppressed and those fighting for freedom in Iran. And in particular, he took up the cause of women who took to the streets to protest the law that mandates that women must wear a hijab, that scarf, in public. And this is a program where we'll be talking with the filmmakers of Nazreen and others, including from Penn, the International Organization Defending uh, the Rights of Expression for artists and writers uh, and political dissidents throughout the world. So I invite everyone watching tonight uh, to come to the pro program this Sunday and to watch the film Nazreen. And they can buy a ticket uh, for that film by going to Revolution Books nyc.org. So what we wanted to do is we want to share with you right now the trailer to this film. It's an extraordinary film. Let's take a look. Nasrin Sotudeh is a prominent lawyer in Iran who's been fighting for children's rights, women's rights, and human rights. She is one of the bravest voices in Iran. She took on cases that other lawyers were too afraid to take on. We've seen Nazreen Sotudeh jailed for defending human rights. And it has cost her and her young family a lot. Protesting against the law which forces Iranian women to wear the hijab. The country's most prominent human rights activist and a voice for the voiceless. I had been in Iran maybe a week and I knew how to toe the line as a woman. And then I meet Nasrin Sotudeh, who doesn't toe the line at all. On Wednesday, Nasrin Sotudeh was again arrested. She had been tried and convicted in absentia. According to her husband, she intends to continue her activism from prison. I have to say, every time I see that footage of the women taking off their hijabs and waving it in public, I am I, I'm very emotional watching that. It. It's so courageous and it's so needed. And you learn quite a bit about this. And, and it really matters that Nasreen has taken up those cases. Raymond, could you put this um, program that you are hosting and the situation with Iranian political prisoners, can you give us a sense of the moment this is taking place in and the international movement that's developed? Yes, um, Nazreen is Nazreen, as the film uh, shows us, and she's also bigger than Nazreen. She's a symbol, you know, of the resistance in Iran and the fight against repression. And in the last period, uh, just you know, over the last year, the Iranian government uh, has uh, launched a massive crackdown on a broad range of forces who are resisting this regime and all the horrors it brings down. Uh, labor activists, uh, human rights activists, artists, writers, uh, women fighting for their freedom, people from uh, minority religious groups and 
uh, national minorities like Arabs and Kurds, liberals, progressives, revolutionaries, a wide range of people who are being hammered at by this regime, who are being thrown in these prisons. And Nazreen is a symbol of this battle to free all Iran's political prisoners. And this is a battle that the people of the world who stand for justice must take up. And it's, it's very important. There actually is an international movement at this point stemming out of Iran, but stretching around the world to burn the cage and free the birds. And we want to show footage from a protest that took place as part of this movement in Frankfurt, Germany in December. And this, this footage features a beautiful Iranian singer, Shadkib Mossadegh. Natarsid, Natarsid, Mohammed, Mohammed, Natarsid, Natarsid, Mohammed, Mohammed, Natarsid, Natarsid, Mohammed, ای صاحبان زندان آمدیم در خیابان بشتنیم قفل زندان به ترسید به ترسید ای صاحبان زندان آمدیم در خیابان بشتنیم قفل زندان به ترسید به ترسید ما همه با هم هستیم به ترسید به ترسید ما همه با هم هستیم بگو گراس نگان را از گلول نترسان بنیاد نظام را در خیابان به سوزان من و تو هم صدا با صدای بی صدایان بشکنیم از خیابان So Raymond, my last question for you is if you could help us understand and situate this fight to free the Iranian political prisoners, what does this have to do with the larger fight to emancipate humanity, which is the mission of this show, and I know a big mission of Revolution Books? Yeah. Um, we are waging this campaign with an internationalist thrust and initiative as followers of the new communism developed by Bob Levakian. Uh, we are going at this from the standpoint of making common cause with our people. These are our people in the dungeons of Iran. And we are taking up this battle with that in mind. Imperialism is a worldwide system of exploitation and oppression. And wherever people stand up against it, we stand with them. The revolution we stand for is a revolution to put an end to all exploitation and oppression. and. What's happening in Iran, the battle against this and the support that we mobilize throughout the world is a battle that advances the cause of this revolution. And it's especially important for people in the belly of the beast here in the United States to stand with the people of Iran, a country that has long been dominated by US imperialism, threatened with war, and now with sanctions in place, look, these sanctions the U.S. imposes on the people of Iran are not diplomatic niceties. You know, this is denying people needed medicines and food. People are dying and suffering. And at the same time, this regime is stepping up its repression. And internationalism is the cause of people standing together to work together, to fight together, to make a revolution, put an end to all of this suffering. And right now, there is a call for us as the burn the cage, free the birds campaign has put it. We may not know each other who are in prison, but we stand together in this battle to put an end to this repression. And in the world today, in the world today, there are two outmoded forces that are confronting people. You have on the one hand, US imperialism with all the exploitation 
the plunder of the planet, the wars and the suffering that brings about. And then you have this oppressive, reactionary, religious, fanatical fundamentalism, you know, that poses as an opponent of imperialism, but is part of the same order that is perpetuating all the horrors and misery that people go through. There must be another way, and there is another way, which Bob Avakian has charted through the new communism, and that is a revolution to emancipate all of humanity. And this battle to stand with the prisoners in Iran, the political prisoners of Iran, is a crucial front in this battle to advance the cause of revolution. And it's a tremendous thing, an inspiring thing, Sansara and the people in the RNL audience that there is in Iran a force that is taking up and applying the new communism developed by Bob Avakian. And that is the Communist Party of Iran, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, which is operating in extremely difficult, savage conditions, you know, to make its contribution to the cause for the emancipation of humanity. So this is why people should be coming out to the program on Sunday, this is why people should be learning about the struggle of the political prisoners of Iran. They should be coming out and watching to be part of this cause, this common movement to stand with these political prisoners of Iran and to stand against injustice and oppression. And from the standpoint of the movement for revolution here in the belly of the beast, to awaken people to their responsibility to stand with all who stand against oppression. Well, listen, Raymond Loud, I wanna thank you so much for organizing this event this weekend and for taking the time to come on the Revolution Nothing Less show. Thank you for having me on. And I look forward to coming back. And once again, Sunday, come out and watch the show and watch the film. All right, and you can find the information for that at revolutionbooksnyc.org and at revcom.us. And, and going forward in this show, as we as we go into the season two, we'll be following and updating you on the situation with the political prisoners in Iran. So finally, I just wanna let you know that at the end of this episode today, stick around because we're gonna close out the episode with an extraordinary song by the extraordinary singer Angelique Kijo that she wrote specially for this film, Nasreen. We will close out the show with that. So stay tuned. Okay, so that was just, that was really a great segment, uh, Sansara, with you and Raymond Lada, uh, my colleague at Revolution Books in New York, uh, and it was very, uh, very important. But you really did have to tell people about what the special surprise was at the end, didn't you? You couldn't. Hey, I'm a big fan of Angelique Kijo. I think it, uh, I, I didn't want to keep it in. Okay. You know, a big part of the new communism is that the whole world comes first, and this is about the emancipation of all humanity. And, and internationalism is a feature of what this show is about. And so we'll be taking you around the world into the history of, uh, of the development of, of revolution, but also to the struggles of people uh, around the world. But now we want to give you a chance, as I said earlier at the top of the show, to actually experience Bob Avakian for yourself. And as I said, then 2014, November of 2014, Bob Avakian and Cornel West had a dialogue at Riverside Church in New York on revolution and religion. This is an extremely important conversation. It bears very heavily on the prospects for the emancipation of humanity. Uh, and one of the things you're going to get in this segment is the uh, tremendous humanity of both of them. Uh, but I, one thing about Bob Avakian that I, I think is really uh, extremely rare, uh, he's someone who's been able to develop scientific theory on a whole other level. He's really developed the science of revolution, yet at the same time, he has a very deep understanding of and a visceral connection with the most oppressed people. And he's able to break down concepts 
big concepts into ways that people can grasp them, and they feel that, and they feel that this man gets us. So this is very important, and I think that comes through, and you just really get a sense of, uh, of the humanity in a revolution that's radically different than anything that's come before. So with that, why don't we just go uh, right to it? We got to go to the students. In the 60s, I was a student in the 60s on the college campus. That's how I got involved in the free speech movement and then working with the Black Panther Party and fighting against the Vietnam War. Why? Because when you get into it, when you're a student, I know a lot of them waste their time on nonsense. But at least when you're a student in college, you have the opportunity to learn about a lot of things if you want to do so and you take some initiative to do so. You have ideas that you can work with. You have the life of the mind that you can pursue if you have a mind to do it. And in the 60s, a lot of students did that. They would look at the world around them. Like I said, they saw people rising up and they said, I want to know what this is about. But, but, I want to understand but, this. But, but, but I think in the 60s, we had something else too. And this is a result of the cultural and spiritual war that went hand in hand with the class war that when we turned on the radio and heard the voice of a David Ruffin, or when we turned on the radio and heard Sheila and Wanda Hutchison of the Emotions saying, there was a tenderness and a sweetness and a kindness that is the raw stuff of any kind of movement. Right. Whereas today, you know, it's say my name, say my name, as opposed to try a little tenderness, the old is redden. It's hard to find tenderness, sweetness, and kindness. Same is true in terms of the collectivities. You see, when we turn on the radio, who did we hear? We heard the Delphonics and the Dramatics. We heard Enchantment. You see, we heard Lakeside. We heard Ohio Players. Heaven must be like this and skin tight. We heard a tenderness and a sweetness. When they turn on the radio today with the oligarchs and plutocrats, the same ones who control recording and radio, and video, and live performance. A cultural, a cult, that's, that's exactly right though, brother, I love that. It's a cultural, spiritual kind of call and tell pro. If somehow we can make sure that the precious souls of young black people, and of course by young black people, you're talking about all folk, because young people have been Afro-Americanized since Motown, <laughs> since the Funkadelic, since James Brown, so if we can keep their souls so chilly, and I see this in teaching in prisons for 37 years, I can see the shift in it. To keep the soul so chilly, the conscience so coarsened, and the heart so hardened that you don't have the raw stuff for a movement. The p people can't wait just to get over, to, be, to manipulate and dominate or be obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. Because <laughs> everybody's just trying to get over by any means. That's Wall Street. Not one Wall Street executive went to jail given all the crimes that took place in 2008. They didn't get caught yet. But that sends the same kind of sign in the young folk. But see, but again, when you talk about black people, you got to talk about our spirits and our souls and bodies as well as the organizing and mobilizing or we'll never be able to pull it off. Yeah, well, I agree. I think that, you see what I mean? okay. Yeah, I do. I agree. <laughs> I, I think that culture is very important. I mean, if you go back to the beginnings yeah. of hip hop and you leave aside sort of silly things like rapper's delight or whatever, you know, which had a nice, had a, had a nice, nice beat. Nice beat, nice beat. Had, nice had beat. a nice beat, but it wasn't about much. And the but, brother just died too, you know. Yeah. That brother just died. God bless his soul. But then you got, then you got, you know, uh, Melly Mel. And, and, Grandmaster and, Flash and, and the Fury Grandmaster Five. Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel. Then you've got oh, Public oh, Enemy with yeah, Chuck D. And they, and they were, they were, Clan. They were talking about oh, something. Oh yes. And what happened? The people who control things in the music industry and in general came in and said, "We don't want that." That's right. Ice T went from being cop killer to being a cop on TV, and they said, "This is, this, this is the way. This is the way you you want to make it. This is the way you make it. All the rest of that stuff." We're going to push that aside and not let it flourish. So, but I think what's happening now, when you talk about yeah. a new wave, oh, no, the wave when you have a new wave of struggle, it brings forward or can bring forward a new culture. And I agree with you. I mean, I grew up on those songs that had tenderness oh, yeah. and love too. You know, it's, it's very rich, different. Rich, and rich and stuff. it's not weak to love. 
I think that's something very important. That's it's, exactly right. It, it is not weak to love. It is not weak to treat other people as human beings. And we need a culture, right. that, a culture that grows together with the actual struggle and is a crucial part of the struggle that promotes the kind of values you're talking about, that promotes right. looking out for each other and being together and seeing what we have in common instead of trying to get over on each other. And I believe, I mean, let me look. Uh, I forget his, I can't call his Johannes name right. Johannes Hernandez, Johannes Hernandez. Give it up for Sister Johannes Hernandez, leader of the Mumia Abu Jamal movement, along with Mark Taylor. We love you, we love you, Johannes. We love you, Johannes. Love you, though, sister. Uh, no, I'm sorry to take No, that's all right. That's, yeah. No, we got to pay respect. Yeah, but, that's true. Uh, I can't call his name, but I know there was a, a rapper recently who did, in, after the assassination of Michael Brown, did a, a, came out with a song about that. I can't remember. There you go, right? Now that's just, you know, that's an example of what happens. It wasn't just, that's right. here's the important thing, I think. It wasn't just because yet another black or brown youth was killed in cold blood. It's because people stood up and said, no, we don't that's care. Right. We're not taking this anymore. That's right. And that's what inspired a little spark of a new culture. And the more that that happens, the more that we can bring forward that culture. And I agree, we need that culture. Oh, yeah. I do agree. I may not agree we need to get it from God, but I agree that we need soul and we need heart. I agree. I agree. I agree. I mean, the wonderful thing is that God doesn't ask for your permission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just play, playing with you, brother. I'm just playing with you. Well, if I ever hear God asking me for my permission, I might change my view. <laughs> oh, Lord. A lot of people see some divine qualities in the love for the masses that you all have in the party. Now, you got to, you got to watch it. Man, that is just such a wonderful ex excerpt of the exchange that they had. I mean, you, there's so much heart, and, and it's very inspiring and moving to hear them talk about the culture and and all of that. So I'm glad we were able to share that. I want to invite everybody watching, if you haven't seen it, and even if you had, the whole dialogue that that is an excerpt of, the talk between Bob Avakian and Cornell West, Revolution and Religion, the fight for emancipation and the role of religion, it bears watching in its fullness. We have it um, featured actually on our channel, youtube.com slash the rev comes. You can watch it there. And so I want to invite people to take a look at all of that. Andy, you want to talk about what we have next? Yeah, well, next we're going to feature a, a, a member of the Get Organized for an Actual Revolution tour. And these are people who've uh, put their lives on hold and have, uh, you know, they, many of them came to Los Angeles uh, to really get out there and organize in the streets. And they were here about two weeks before we learned how serious this uh, pandemic was. And so we've been doing We've been working even within the constraints uh, of, of uh, the safe distancing. They're, they've uh, uh, been here. We have uh, other parts of the tour in Chicago and in uh, New York. And uh, the Revolution Nothing Less show is going to feature their voices throughout the course of uh, the, you know, the coming season. It's one of the features. You're going to get to meet some of the people who take up uh, this New communism developed by Bob Avik and how they're working to build the movement for an actual revolution. And also, just while I'm uh, speaking of that, uh, some of the people who work on the show, like Luan and Pete, they get out in the street and they interview people in, in the midst of protests and different kinds of things, particularly when this uh, quarantining uh, uh, has ended. But this particular segment we're going to show next is from a member of the tour who is a uh, uh, you know, in a, on a Zoom call talking about uh, the kinds of seminars, why people should be part of and register for the seminars that we're going to be doing on this New Year's statement from Bob Avakian. The first one is going to be this coming Saturday that's going to more or less be a presentation and an introduction, and we'll tell you how you can connect up with that. But after that, she's making an argument for people to participate in the more participatory uh, uh, seminars uh, that we're calling Zoom into the Revolution uh, that are coming up. So, but let, let's listen to her speak about this in her own words. Speaking about why people should 
you know, be excited and, and register to join with these different seminars and group discussions and how important that could be. Um, there are people that uh, I think generally feel kind of locked out or intimidated by, um, by some of the more like uh, heavy theoretical stuff. People like my sister, she's never really seen herself as having enough knowledge or expertise or confidence um, to even understand like what shapes reality, anything in the realm of politics, you know, she feels scared off from and feels like she shouldn't have an opinion about, um, which just isn't the case at all. You know, there are people like her and so many others I know speaking about like the, the different collectivity I was a part in like getting into this statement. We all come from different walks of life. We share similar experiences. We have very different experiences and the unevenness among us and how we understand the world and how we approach things. Um, and then the, the coming together to actually like surface what's in the statement um, and, and get deeply into how we understand it, um, not just on the surface, but having to work through our thinking. You know, I think it, it's just really beneficial. I've gotten a lot out of it. I've spoken to people about some of the some of the substance in the statement. And, you know, we're, we're having a discussion about like how they see what happened on the 6th. I'm asking them how they understand fascism. And, you know, as, as they're engaging the statement, we're talking about the appreciation we have for like the, you know, the analysis that BA has given about like the economic base and how that's developed and how that changes the social relations. You know, if, if, I, if I happen to be like pretty caffeinated and I'm passionate about what I'm saying, they're like, wow, you know, we sound like, you have a lot of conviction and behind what you're saying. I wish I had that much conviction. Or they say like, oh, I didn't think about things that way before. And I'm learning from them as well. But um, the thing is I say like, you know, we should, we should get together and we should have more of these discussions. I volunteer with uh, the social media team and we put on um, Zoom discussions over different articles that BA has written in the past. Yeah. So when people are saying like, oh, I wish I had that conviction or, oh, that's like, I never had that understanding. And they're, you know, they, they seem to be, um, you know, expressing that they're getting a lot out of our discussion. I say like, it's not as if I just, you know, I can just sit in a room alone and like recite what I know in a mirror. It's through a process of collective wrangling with reality. It's through a process of being excited to to try and take on these difficult subjects about like what's happening and why is it actually happening. And it's through like a spirit of curiosity and inquiry and for a reason for the emancipation of humanity where you can be excited if you're struggled with and you're wrong. And sometimes you can be struggled with and you can be really stubborn <laughs> about it. But um, but you know, this this process of about coming to know and understand the world scientifically, it's something that can't just happen in like some vacuum sealed experience. We have to be working with reality as it changes. And there's no greater strength that we have. I mean, the, I think, you know, the strength that we have um, definitely is like the leadership of BA and the whole framework of uh, a scientific method and approach to reality. Like that sets the foundation. And then our collectivity on top of that um, and bringing in our different strengths and different weaknesses and different perspectives and, and and all with a common goal in mind of like, how are we going to work together to, to, to get to communism, to get beyond the four alls by Marx, to get beyond these, you know, class divisions and uh, oppressive relations. And, you know, how are we going to emancipate humanity together? And with that spirit, actually go to work together. Um, so I think that's a big reason why people should feel compelled and not intimidated. They should feel really excited that these seminars are going to happen um, and, and, I encourage people to join them and, and participate and contribute their insights and, um, and what they don't know and their questions, because we can work through that together and all get a lot out of it. All right. So if, you want to get into this together, like she said, if this if that moved you, and I hope it did. Um, and really, to repeat, uh, anybody, everybody who has a desire to understand the world and change it towards emancipation, you are qualified. You should join this seminar, especially this first one on Saturday coming up, which will be an introductory one. 
a chance for everybody to get their feet wet. And then through that, you can determine and we can determine together with you what's a best form if you want to go further in one of these Zoom into the revolution seminars that's that's you know over the course of several weeks to go deeper into this New Year's statement from Bob Avakian. So how do you do this? There's a few ways I want to let you know right now that you can look in the description of this YouTube and you can see we'll lay out where you click, where you go, how you register. Also, you can visit revcom.us and you can find the registration for the seminars there. Or if you want, you can just send us an email to get organized for revolution tour at gmail.com. We'll put that on the screen, get organized for revolution tour at gmail.com. We really want to invite you. And if you have people that you know who are concerned, who are anguished about what's happening, um, who you think should be part of this, invite them. We really want to bring everybody who, who is concerned about the state of humanity into this. And, and we'll start a process through that. So Andy? Yeah, okay. So you, you know, we had on the screen the uh, actual article and where you can find it on revcom.us. You can print it out. Uh, I spoke about the this statement earlier in the show. And you can also go on our YouTube channel, The Revcoms, to see this special episode we did last week on uh, this statement. It, it, it's a very uh, deep and rich uh, episode on this. But now we're going to come to our next segment. This is something we do regularly on the show, not every week, but it's, 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 it's something that everybody has gotten a lot out of in our first season. It's called American Crime. And this is a series that's on Revcom.us that uh, has, oh, 100 crimes of the, uh, that America has committed in this country and around the world. And for Black History Month, there's a special section uh, of the, uh, uh, the episodes uh, that deal with crimes against black people in this country. <clears throat> and we want to play today uh, one that's uh, case number 12, the 1921 Tulsa Massacre and the Destruction of Black Wall Street. Now, this episode, as are some of the uh, American crime series that we've shown, was uh, the video was uh, created by David Zeiger, who's uh, been a regular contributor to the show. He's a filmmaker. He makes a documentary filmmaker. He, he's uh, made a film called Sir No Sir on the GI resistance movement, which you can... Uh, you know, find on the internet um, uh, during Vietnam, during Vietnam, right? And uh, and he himself was a participant in the, the coffee house movement supporting GI resistance in that time. And we're going to be talking with David in subsequent episodes about this American crime series and how many of you can be a part of creating these through doing research and doing other ways of actually making your own, uh, working on your own American crime series that we might uh, broadcast on our show or make available to people. So I want to go to this uh, right away. It's, it's, it's very well done. For those who've seen it before, it is worth seeing again. And through the course of this month, we're going to be doing other, um, uh, other American crimes on the, uh, for Black History Month. So let's watch this first, and then I have one more comment about Black History Month uh, when we, after we see this episode. Okay, here's a pop quiz. What was the site of the biggest race riot in the history of this country? Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. That's right, the great state of Oklahoma, home of lovable farmers and ranchers who just need to learn how to be friends and share all those wide open spaces. In the decades following the Civil War, Oklahoma was the destination for both white settlers and former slaves looking to build a new life. It was also the final destination of the Trail of Tears, the forced march of the southeastern Native American tribes, but that's another American crime story. When Oklahoma became a state in 1907, the very first law they passed legalized and enforced racial segregation. After all, they had to make it a real American state. Tulsa, then, was a sleepy town of 10,000. But with the discovery of oil three years later, the population grew to over 100,000 in just one decade. Among those were thousands of black people looking for a better life and hoping to escape the worst of Jim Crow, Mississippi, Georgia, and other states of the Old South. In 1921, Tulsa was strictly segregated. Black people could work in town, but all black residents were required to live and shop in the Greenwood District of Northern Tulsa. Greenwood's segregated economy, self-contained and self-sufficient, 
was so successful that it became known nationally as the Black Wall Street. Black-owned grocery stores, banks, libraries, hotels, restaurants, movie theaters, and more lined Greenwood Avenue. But here's what happened on May 30th, 1921. Dick Rowland, a 19-year-old black shoe shiner working downtown, enters the elevator of the only building with a restroom that blacks can use in the area. Sarah Page, a white 17-year-old, is the elevator operator. When the door closes, Page cries out, and Roland, who may have just tripped and stepped on her foot, runs off knowing what can happen. Sure enough, he's alleged, without evidence, to have assaulted Page. He's arrested the next morning and held in a jail cell above City Hall. Then the headlines hit. The Tulsa Tribune declares Nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator and headlines an editorial, quote, to lynch Negro tonight, end quote. Within an hour, a lynch mob in the hundreds descends on the courthouse. Word spreads throughout Greenwood that whites are storming the courthouse and Roland is in danger. At 9 p.m., a group of 25 armed black men, some World War I veterans, drive to the courthouse determined to stop the lynching. The local authorities refuse their offer to help, and they leave. But the heavily armed white mob is incensed. When a group of 75 black men return to the courthouse and are again turned away, a white man approaches an armed black army veteran and demands he turn over his gun. A fight breaks out, and a gun goes off. Historian and author Scott Ellsworth wrote, While the first shot fired at the courthouse may have been unintentional, those that followed were not. Almost immediately, members of the white mob, and possibly some law enforcement officers, opened fire on the African-American men who returned volleys of their own. The initial gunplay lasted only a few seconds, but when it was over, as many as a dozen men, both black and white, lay dead or wounded. Outnumbered more than 20 to 1, the black men began a retreating fight toward the African-American district with armed whites in close pursuit. They tried to kill all the black folks they could see, a survivor George Monroe recalled later. As many as 500 white men and boys are immediately sworn in as, quote, special deputies, end quote, and told to, quote, get a gun and get a nigger, end quote. Deputies pass out weapons from a sporting goods store across the street. White rioters begin firing on blacks and setting fire to black-owned homes and businesses late into the night. Then as dawn approaches, literally thousands of armed whites, some estimated as many as 10,000, gathered in three locations on the edges of Greenwood. A siren sounds at daybreak, and the mobs of white terrorists launch their invasion. These armed white mobs include over 150 Tulsa police. They set about systematically killing, looting, and burning the entire district of Greenwood, block by block. Armed whites break into black homes and businesses and force the people outside, where they are led away at gunpoint to internment centers set up by the authorities. Anyone who resists is shot. If guns are found inside, the occupant is shot. Homes and businesses are looted, then set on fire with torches and oil-soaked rag. House by house, block by block, Greenwood is demolished. Even airplanes are used to shoot black people from the air and drop kerosene bombs on buildings, setting them ablaze. Tremendously outnumbered, black Tulsans fight back. Riflemen take positions atop the belfry of a newly built church to try and halt the white invasion. But the church is burned to the ground. Deputized police and the National Guard units arrest 6,000 Greenwood residents. Black Tulsans don't go down without a fight but they're outgunned and outnumbered. Survivors recounted black bodies loaded on trains and dumped off bridges into the Arkansas River and, most frequently, tossed into mass graves. By noon on June 1st, these white mobs had murdered more than 300 black Tulsa residents. They had turned 40 square blocks of Greenwood into a scorched wasteland, including 1,256 homes destroyed along with virtually every other structure, churches, schools, businesses, even a hospital and library. More than 10,000 residents were left homeless. Thousands of black Tulsans spent the winter living in tents. Many left for good, 
having had enough of Tulsa, Oklahoma. A grand jury investigation organized by Oklahoma's governor in the days after the massacre referred to the events in Tulsa as a, quote, Negro uprising, end quote, concluding, quote, the assembly was quiet until the arrival of armed Negroes, which precipitated and was the direct cause of the entire affair, end quote. But that ain't all, folks. The Tulsa race riot was erased from the state and country's history for 76 years. It wasn't until 1997 that a commission was established in Oklahoma to study the riot. And what did they find? Quote, not one of these criminal acts was then or ever has been prosecuted or punished by government at any level, municipal, county, state, or federal. Okay, so that was an incredible short film on the Tulsa Massacre of 1921 created by David Zeiger for the Revolution Nothing Less show. We'll be doing more of these American crimes on the oppression of black people in this country uh, in, for the rest of the uh, Black History Month. Also, I just wanted to say that for Black History Month, we're going to be having a, a special segment uh, of an article that is on Revcom.us, right at the top of the website, called Bob Avakian for the Liberation of Black People and the Emancipation of All Humanity. Uh, and this is something that you don't want to miss because the work he's done on this is, is just extraordinary, and it actually points the way forward for how, indeed, Black people can not only be liberated, but the role they have to play and can play in the emancipation of all humanity. And so this is probably be next week or the following week, so stay tuned for, for that. And you can read the article now on Revcom.us. And so uh, why don't we uh, introduce our final, almost a surprise segment. The spoiler over here. I was the spoiler. So listen, before we do, I just want to say we've, we're coming to the end of our episode, first episode of season two. And, you know, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to say if you haven't yet, please subscribe to our channel, hit the like button below, leave a comment, let us know what you think or a question, and we'll try to respond. We read everything you say. And uh, anything else you want to say before we send off with this song? I'll introduce it. Yeah, I do. There's a, there's a number of things I, I, I do want to say. We're starting a second season. We learned a lot the first year. We're still learning. But this is an incredible show. There's nothing else like it. But we need you. We need you in a lot of different ways. We need you to spread the show, as Sansara just said. We need your funds. We need funds to be able to really expand our reach of the show and, and also for certain technical things that we're trying to do. One of the things, if you go back and look on our uh, on our YouTube page, uh, we had these incredible uh, dialogues that were and discussions, roundtables that Sansara hosted on uh, Pacifica Radio that we co-sponsored by Refuse Fascism and the Revolution Nothing Less show, and that also is a feature of what we do. Uh, we interview people on this show, uh, professionals, and you know a lot of people talking about uh, how the COVID crisis, how things were very slow in in people understanding the importance of masks. Well, actually, we had Dr. Phil Rice on this show in early March, where we, he pointed out, not only do you need to wear masks to protect yourself, but to protect society. And had everybody been watching the Revolution Nothing Less show, this pandemic could have been uh, uh, mi mitigated. A lot of lives would have been saved. And there's a lot of other things in this show. Bob Avakian talked about the danger of this coup uh, eight months ago, nine months ago, he wrote about it. See, when you have a scientific approach to reality, you can actually understand where things are headed. Not that you have a crystal ball, but you can understand things and, and then actually prepare for them. So I do want to encourage people to, uh, to spread the show, uh, to get involved in it, uh, to volunteer. There's all kinds of things. I'm not going to take any more time today to walk through the various ways you can be a part of it. But if, if this has uh, excited you today, then, then drop us a line uh, at our uh, email on uh, uh, Gmail, the revcoms at gmail.com. 
So uh, for me, uh, I'm glad to see you, Sansara, and I understand you're coming back to uh, Los Angeles, and soon we'll be here at this table together, and I won't be constantly looking down at the computer to see you. Um, so I can yeah, we get a little we get a little patch of quarantine in the middle to do it the right way, but but pretty soon. I'll I'll be there with you, so I'm I'm very much Great. looking forward to that. So, um, you know, Great. so I, I yeah, gonna I'm going to announce it. I'm going to do it. So here go we go. Ahead, go for it. <laughs> We're going to send you out with, uh, as I mentioned before, um, a song from the singer, songwriter, performer Angelique Kijo about Nasreen, the political prisoner in Iran, and really for all the political prisoners in Iran. It's called "How Can I Tell You." It's an extraordinary song. It's a beautiful video and really feel it with your heart. We're going to send it, send you out with it. All right. Thank you, Sansara. Good night. How can I tell you my truth, little one. How can I tell you the things I have done? Though I cannot see the sky, you know, I only think of you. And you shine for me more brightly than the sun. And how can I tell you the tears I have shed? Are you still lonely each night in your bed? I could tell you to forget me, but the words would not be true. Nazarene.